Hi, Sue here from um, Parent Education and today we're going to run through baby care and going home, so class four. Um, first of all, we'll just talk about the checks that we perform on mom and on baby just to make sure that they're both healthy and well before they leave the hospital. Um, so for mom, the midwife will perform a postnatal midwives check. So basically that's a head to toe check just to make sure mom is feeling well before she leaves. So starting off at the head and working our way down, we're making sure is mom emotionally feeling okay. So we'll usually ask her to fill out uh, Edinburgh postnatal depression score. It's a little 12 question questionnaire. Again, just to give us an idea of like emotionally, how is she feeling? Every woman will be given the contact details of the mental health support midwives as well before they leave. Um, working our way down, we are thinking about like even from a pain relief point of view, um, what was mum taking when she was in here in the hospital? So generally after, well, either a cesarean section or a vaginal birth, certainly by the time you're thinking about going home from hospital, you're taking paracetamol and ibuprofen um, as pain relievers, which are both over the counter analgesias. Um, the midwife will happily run through with you what you'd been taking, how often you had been taking it, um, just to give you a bit of an idea as to you know what plan for your pain relief to mirror when you get home. So kind of I'd say follow, mimic what we were doing in here for the first day or two. Um, and then when you get home, as you get moving around more, you'll find that you probably don't need to take pain relief as often. Working our way down, now we're thinking about the feeding. So, you know, is baby feeding well? Are you confident with the feeding? Is baby latching well? Has your milk come in? Um, is baby's weight okay? And, you know, is baby having plenty of wet nappies? So we'll usually ask you a few questions around this. Again, just to make sure that you're confident and you're happy going home with the feeding. Um, maybe if it was a thing that you weren't sure about the latch, you know, the midwife might sit with you and observe a feed before you go home. Again, just to give her and you confidence that all is going okay. Um, working our way down, um, we're thinking about your womb. So we want to make sure that your womb is well contracted after you've had your baby. So if it's okay with you, the midwife will just pop a hand on your tummy and just feel your womb. So over your skin, she'll be able to feel that just to make sure that it is well contracted. She'll also ask you some questions about your postnatal bleeding. So it's normal to ha have some bleeding after you have a baby. and um, We call it lochia and it will be normal for up to six weeks after you have a baby. Things that we wouldn't consider normal with lochia would be if it were to remain quite heavy, even after the point of about a week. So, you know, week one, it might be the same heaviness as a period, um, but usually from the point of a week, we would like it to kind of start to get a little bit lighter as the days go on. So if it remained quite heavy a week after you'd had your baby, if there was any offensive smell um, from the bleeding, or if you were passing blood clots larger than a two euro coin. So if you were experiencing any of these three things, certain before you go home from hospital, absolutely let your midwife know. Um, or if you are actually at home from hospital, maybe you could link in with your GP or call us here in your maternity hospital and, and describe what's going on and we can make a plan. Um, so she'll ask about your bleeding. If you have any stitches, so if you had an abdominal wound or if you have perineal stitches, Again, if it's okay with you, it would be super if one of the midwives could just review that wound before you went home, just so that we can assure you that all is healing as it should be before you go home. Um, if you had a cesarean section, um, one of our obstetricians will come around to review you. They'll also answer any questions that you have, maybe about why the cesarean section was performed or you know so if any unanswered questions just feel free to have a chat with the obstetrician when they come around to review you before you go home and um, generally you probably won't need any prescriptions and um, the pain relief that women take in the early days would be over the counter you know the ibuprofen and the paracetamol and um, but if in the unlikely scenario whereby you were going home with a prescription, you know, maybe for an antibiotic or a blood pressure medication, the midwife will very clearly, a midwife and the obstetrician would very clearly explain like what this prescription is for, and um, how long you'll be taking the medication for, and any follow-up that's required. Okay. Um, follow-up appointments. 
So standard would be a six week checkup with your GP, okay? So that's covered in your combined care and it's just for you to remember to make that appointment yourself. So it's a free appointment, you just need to make it yourself. If you were attending a private consultant in the hospital, that six week checkup would probably be covered under your care package. So you could make your six week appointment to come here. It's exactly the same check, depend whether you're going to the GP or the consultant. Um, if you had maybe like gestational diabetes would be an example. Um, we might ask you to come back here at six weeks for a glucose tolerance test. So, you know, there are times where for medical reasons, we might ask you to come back to us as well as your six week checkup. Um, but it would al always be as well as, and we would always be letting you know, um, you know, to be expecting an appointment in the post before you leave here. Um, before the baby goes home. So a pediatrician is gonna come around to your bedside and they're gonna perform a, a head to toe check. So they'll examine baby in the cot beside your bed. They'll strip baby off completely. So right down, taking off his vest, his baby grow, and into his nappy. And at the bedside, so beside you, they will check baby from head to toe. So starting off at baby's head, they're checking the little plates in his skull. We're checking his fontanelles, having a little look in his eyes, his nose, his mouth, his ears. And then we're just running our hand over his skeleton, just making sure his little collarbones, his arms, his fingers are okay. Same with his torso, his spine, his legs, his feet. Um, we're reviewing his umbilical cord, reviewing his genitalia, rolling him on his side, checking his spine, his anus. And then with the stethoscope, we're gonna check his breathing and we're gonna check his heart as well. Okay, and um, once all those checks have been performed and the pediatrician is happy that he's good to go, he's he anytime once once you've been checked as well, you're good to go. And um, another check that would be performed at some point in the hospital would be a hearing check. So um, hearing technicians will come around to the bedside and they have a machine to check the hearing. So what we do is we have our, our little um, body of the machine, which is attached to a wire with a little probe at the end of it. So they just pop the probe into the entrance to baby's ear canal. It will omit a sound wave and it will also detect a response from the eardrum, giving us reassurance that baby's hearing is okay. From time to time, when we do this test, our machine might say, inconclusive result. So generally when it's telling us this, it's just some reason why we can't get a result. And the most common reason is that there's a little bit of amniotic fluid there in baby's ear and we just have to let it evaporate over a couple of days and do the test again. So if you do have an inconclusive result, I would say don't panic, don't worry. We'll be giving you an appointment to come back and we'll repeat the test when you come back. Um, the hip check, Okay, so as part of the pediatrician's check, we're gonna be reviewing baby's hips, okay? And the pediatrician will also be asking you if there's any family history of clicky hips or hip dysplasia in your family. So if you're not sure, maybe ask around over the next couple of weeks, just so you know the answer to that question um, when the pediatrician asks you. If even like despite a normal hip check, so if baby's hips are perfect, but there is a family history of this hip dysplasia, um, it would be routine that we would send your baby for hip follow-up anyway, you know, just to be sure, to be sure. Um, another reason for hip follow-up would be if baby was sitting in your tummy in a breech position. So bum first, um, and maybe if you had a cesarean section for breech, um, we'd just check those little hips at six weeks as well. Um, so once all those checks are done, it's time to go. Um, the heel prick check. Just to mention, it can be performed at any point between 72 and 120 hours of baby's life. So day three or day four or day five. Um, who's going to perform it? Well, I suppose it depends where you are. If you are in the hospital, say if you had a cesarean section, for example, and you were here until day four or day five, um, your midwife would perform your heel prick check for you here. Um, but say you went home on day two or day three after a vaginal birth, you would be home and your public health nurse would be calling, so your public health nurse would perform the test. Um, when you're leaving the hospital, one, you're going to be, I suppose, in one of two 
zones. Either you've had the heel prick check performed or you'll have a very clear plan as to who's going to perform it and when it's going to be performed. Okay, so we'll organise all that and we'll let you know. Um, what are we testing for? So we're testing for these eight disorders here. So cystic fibrosis, phenylketonuria, galactosemia, gluartic aciduria type 1, congenital hypothyroidism, maple syrup urine disease, homocystinuria, and medium chain acyl codehydrogenase deficiency, MADD. Okay. Um, the instances of baby coming back um, with a positive result for one of these disorders without a family history is incredibly rare, okay? Um, it's about one in eight to 10,000. Um, so with this news, because the likelihood is so low that baby's gonna get a positive result without a family history, um, we say no news is good news, okay? So the test will be performed, it'll be sent up to Temple Street, but if you've heard nothing a week after the test has been performed, that means that all is good. Baby is negative for any of these disorders. Um, when we're performing the test, so how do we do it? We need to take a little sample of blood from baby's heel, okay? Babies have little fatty pockets on their heels just to the outside, so in and around here, and they feel quite like the pads of our fingers. Okay, so that's the easiest place for us to perform the heel prick check. And it's very like taking a blood sugar level from baby's heels, that same pinprick to the skin. Okay, once we do that, we have a little card that looks something like this with four circles on it. So one, two, three, four, and we just need to fill each circle with blood that's dripping from baby's heel. And um, what we do know is that warm feet bleed easily, okay? So it's a good, which is a good thing when it comes to this test. So it's a good idea just to get a little pair of baby socks and just pop them on baby's feet, usually the, the night before the test is due. So we'll have his little baby grow on, but then over each foot, he will just have a little pair of socks as well. So baby grow and then sock, okay? That just means that his feet are warm, it'll mean that the blood will flow a little bit easier on the day of the test. Um, you could give your baby a little foot massage, you know, while the, when the public health nurse arrives, while she's chatting to you and you're filling out the form, you could just be giving his foot a little bit of a rub. And again, that's going to get the circulation going, which is going to make this test just a little bit quicker, which is going to be a bit easier for your baby. Um, we know that babies are very happy when they're feeding or when they're doing skin to skin. So you could absolutely latch baby on if baby's looking in any way hungry, or if he's not looking hungry, maybe a little bit of skin to skin just to keep him happy and chilled while the test is being performed. Um, going home from hospital. Okay, so what do we need to know? Number one, is baby warm enough? So when you're dressing him, dress him in one layer more than you. If you're going home in your jumper and your t-shirt, your baby's gonna be in a vest, a baby grow, and a cardigan. Okay, so always in one layer more than you. It's gonna be his first time going outside, so pop his little hat on him, okay? He'll be going home in his car seat, so your partner will bring the car seat up to the ward, um, and together you can pop baby into the car seat. If you're not driving home, say you just walk, live just a stroll away from the hospital, your partner will bring the pram in, and you can bring baby home in the pram, okay? Once baby is sitting in the car seat, um, hat on, one layer more than you, straps fastened. We want to make sure that the straps aren't too tight or too loose. So we do that by just popping two fingers between baby and the strap and the same on the other side. And if the fingers fit snugly, that's letting us know that it's the perfect, it's, it's not too tight or too loose. Um, we want to keep baby warm. We're probably going to pop a jacket on. Um, so we don't put jackets on babies because it can interfere with the safety of the the car seat, it's very hard to strap the strap securely when baby's wearing a, a puffy jacket. So we don't use jackets or body suits, we just um, use a nice cellular blanket. Okay, so something like this, two to four layers would pr be perfect and just pop baby's hands outside the blankets just to make sure that, um, just to make sure the baby can't bring that up over his head. So that's your baby, all good to go. Um, your midwife will happily review baby in the car seat before you leave the ward. Um, 
If you have an eyes a fixed space for your car seat, I would say no harm just to have that fitted or fit it yourself correctly about 37 weeks. So you're driving around with your base and your car for a few weeks, but it just means it's one less thing to worry about when you're going in to collect baby. I'd link in to the RSA website, so www.rsa.ie. Um, you know, every now and again, babies are going to be in car seats until they're either 150 centimetres tall or 36 kilos. So that averages at about 11 years old. Um, so check in with the RSA website, you know, every, every couple of months just to make sure the baby's in an appropriate fitting car seat. Um, the RSA website do perform check it fits points in all around nationwide. Um, so you just check the website, where is the check it fits point near you next? Um, and you know, if you're thinking maybe baby needs a new car seat, it would be one of these points where you'd have an RSA member review the baby in the car seat and review the car seat in your car, make sure everything's fitting correctly or advise you if they feel that baby needs the next car seat up. Um, when you look at the picture there, there's Will and Kate heading home from hospital and you can see that I suppose no matter who you are, everybody is heading home from hospital in exactly the same way. We've got the partner carrying the car seat. We don't want moms carrying babies in car seats after they've had new babies. So we've got the partner carrying the car seat. We've got baby in a cellular blanket, a little hat on and he's just got mum nice and secured there because it's her first time out of hospital. Um, so that's that, that's getting home safely. Thanks a million.